Afterwards, we'll be joined virtually by Mrs. Hamer's niece, Monica Land, and the film's director, Joy Davenport, for a discussion followed by audience Q&A. This is part of our Sunday screening series with our partners, the Mississippi Film Office and the Mississippi Humanities Council. So that event is free and will start at 2 p.m. Then come back next week for History's Lunch when John Ramsey Miller and Stephen Smith will join us to discuss their newest book on McCarty Pottery and Marigold, this one focusing on the jewelry made by Lee and Pup throughout the years. So if you came to their first one where they looked at the pottery a few years ago, um, you know how interesting that place is and what insights they have there. Today, we're delighted to welcome Bobby J. Smith II talking about his book, Food, Power, Politics, the food story of the Mississippi Delta Civil Rights Movement. Bobby Smith lives in Chicago and he was not scared of this weather at all. And he was ready to hop on that plane and come down yesterday, but I had to say to him midday, the Jackson is not like Chicago. <laughs> and we don't have the equipment that they have in Chicago and that our roads, especially some of those smaller roads were frightening, terrifying. And we couldn't be sure that we could get him safely from the airport to downtown. So Bobby will join us virtually but we love him just the same, and we're going to get him back to Mississippi as soon as we can. He was here before, and while he was here, he and Michael Morris, the director now of the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum and Museum of Mississippi History, became good friends. And so I want to invite Michael to the stage to say a few words about Bobby Smith. Good afternoon. Um, Bobby J. Smith II <laughs> is Assistant Professor of African American Studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He earned his BS in Agriculture from Prairie View a and University, which he's a proud graduate of, it's an HBCU. And he earned his Master's in Agricultural Economics and PhD in Developmental Psychology, um, both from Cornell University. Smith has been awarded fellowships from the American Council of Learning Societies, the National Endowment of the Humanities, the Center for the Study of Southern Culture um, at the University of Mississippi Special Collections, and University Archives at the University of Illinois at Chicago. But what I'm most proud of in terms of Bobby Smith is his time here at the Department of Archives and History as the Megger and Murley Evers Institute um, partner. Um, he was the Megger and Mur Murley um, Evers Scholar. Um, his book, Food, Power, Politics, is the inaugural book of the newly launched Black Food Justice Series at the University of North Carolina Press. Help me welcome my good friend, Bobby J. Smith. Thank you, Mike, for the, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you, um, everyone, for attending today, both online as well as in person. Uh, again, as Chris Goodwin said, I was looking forward to being in Jackson. Um, as we spoke midday yesterday, I was already packed up and ready to go, but we decided to go the virtual route. So I'm still excited to be in conversation uh, with you all at the museum, as well as the Department of Archives and History. And I look forward to the Q&A session after this discussion. <clears throat> this is one of the first times I've had a chance to actually, excuse me, <clears throat> one of the first times I actually had a chance to really talk about this book um, with people from in, in Mississippi. I was there a couple of months ago um, working with the Mississippi Humanities Council where I did some work in the Delta around the book, but it was more so a panel style. This is one of the first times I get to really talk about the book project that was essentially not, not necessarily born in Mississippi. The stories I tell were born in Mississippi, but the book itself, um, there's a number of ways to tell the story of how I came to the book, and I'll talk about that more when we get into the presentation. So again, thank you all for the opportunity. Thank you to the organizers of History as Much of the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, and I look forward to our future conversations in a few minutes. With that being said, I will move into my slideshow now. So again, I am excited to talk about my book, Food Power Politics, The Food Story of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. This talk will go as follows. I'll jump right into the talk and then we'll get into a Q&A at the end. So the talk will go in three parts. <clears throat> 
Part one, I'll talk about the book's origins, um, background, and then I'll give you some information about the theoretical framework of the book. Um, when I say food power politics, it's not only the title of my book, it's also a theoretical framework that, that underscores uh, my entire book. Then the second part, we'll take a brief look inside the book. Particularly, we'll focus on chapter one of the book, which is titled Food Denied, Food for Freedom, the 1962 through 1963 Greenwood Food Blockade. And then part three, um, I'll provide some conclusions, uh, reflections, and then we'll we'll run into the Q&A. And part three is titled An Entry Point. I don't see my book as concluding. In fact, I see my book telling an ongoing food story of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. Therefore, my book provides an entry point into thinking about other stories about the Civil Rights Movement in Mississippi, particularly through the lens of food. So we'll begin with thinking about uh, the, the origins of, of, of my book. And as I was preparing for this particular talk, I thought a lot about how I came to this book, why I wrote this book, and, and, and why the book is so important to me. And I hope that the and I hope that those who have read the book also have found something helpful in the book. But I wrote the book because I wanted us to do a number of things. One, of course, is for us to rethink what we think we know about the civil rights movement, particularly in Mississippi. But also I wrote the book because I wanted us to rethink the idea of food. Many times when we think about food, we tend to think about food when it's on our plate or when we are at the grocery stores or when we find ourselves encountering at farmers markets. But my book wanted to take a look at food beyond the ways in which we often find ourselves relating to food. And one way I do that is through this book, Food Power Politics. But when I think about how I got to the book, um, when I think about the origin story of this book, I think about a number of things and I, I see myself some eight years ago now when I was a graduate student at Cornell um, in the Department of Development Sociology, I found myself interested in thinking about community organizing and community development. In fact, at the time in 2016, when I unknowingly started this project, I was a graduate student thinking about a number of things, but I also was a graduate student by day, but I was an activist by night. I was active in what we call the food justice movement uh, located there in, in um, Ithaca, New York, but I also was a co-founder of the Ithaca chapter of Black Lives Matter. So I was thinking about a number of things when I encountered Charles Payne's book, I've Got the Light of Freedom, the Organizing Tradition, and the Mississippi Freedom Struggle. Um, anyone who has read Payne's uh, book understands how groundbreaking this work was. And when I encountered this book in a class on community organizing, community development, I was thinking about my work around food justice and also my work with Black Lives Matter. And I kept coming, I, I kept I kept grappling with the question, how does the civil rights movement or how can the civil rights movement speak to what I'm seeing today in, around issues of food security, of food justice, um, as well as other issues of food in African-American communities in particular. And when I say food justice, I'm talking about a social movement that uses food and agriculture as vehicles to address inequities both inside the food system and outside the food system. So therefore, when I encountered Payne's book, I was actually assigned to discuss Payne's book in the seminar class I took in the spring of 2016. And as I was reading the book, I kept again wanting to know how does this book relate to the work that I'm doing around food justice and the work that I'm doing also in Ithaca, New York. Um, at the time, I also was an inaugural member of the Tompkins County Food Policy Council. So again, I was already thinking about food work. I'd already been studying agriculture since my days at Prairie View, as well as my day, my master's degree as well at Cornell. So I've been thinking about food and agriculture for a while. And also I come from generations of black farmers and sharecroppers, both in North Carolina and Texas. So agriculture and food had always been a part of my life. But I kept thinking about how does this book relate to what I'm seeing today? So it, it, again, anyone who's read Payne's book, Payne's book is over 400 pages. So I was reading chapter one and chapter two and chapter three and chapter four. And it wasn't until I got to chapter five that I saw a direct thread between the civil rights movement and what I was seeing today around food justice and food justice activism. And it was in chapter five that I learned about this event that I learned that I soon learned would be called the Greenwood Food Blockade, what activists called the Greenwood Food Blockade there in the Yazoo, Mississippi Delta region of the state. So with, with, with me 
finding this story or uh, I guess uh, rediscovering this story in Payne's book, I took this one story, it was about 10 pages to talk about the Greenwood Food Blockade, and I turned it into my dissertation project. So from the spring 2016 to the spring of 2017, I basically committed my entire academic graduate career at the time to really thinking more about this story around the Greenwood Food Blockade. And I also wondered, were there other stories that centered food in the civil rights movement? Again, when many people think about the civil rights movement, they think about voting rights, they think about education, they think about segregation and public accommodations. But for me, I kept wondering how, what, what was the role and, and is there even a central role that food played in the civil rights movement? Throughout that year, I found myself, again, reading more and more books, reading books by, like, local people, also reading books like In Struggle and other books like that about the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Because in Payne's book, when he talks about the Greenwood Food Block game, he situates it along the line, the historical lines of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, SNCC's work in the Delta region of the state. So again, I found myself wanting to learn more and more about food, and I was getting prepared to take my comprehensive exams. And one of my committee members sent me an email around, I believe, January, no, around February of 2017. Uh, there was a call for applications for the Megger and Merle Evers uh, Scholars Program at the time, now it's a fellowship. And the my, my committee member just emailed it to me and said, you know, you should think about applying for it. So I worked for the next few uh, weeks in February and early March uh, uh, preparing my application. And after I prepared my application, I submitted it, and a few weeks later, I got the notification that I had been selected as a 2017 Megger and Merle Evers Research Scholar. And that scholarship really changed the trajectory of my entire, at the time, dissertation project. And when I went to Mississippi that summer and I met so many amazing people, including uh, Mike Morris, also John Spann at the Humanities Council in Mississippi, and a number of other people uh, uh, who played a major role, uh, archivists who were there, also librarians who were there. It was just an amazing experience. But then also the experience showed me that there was much more to this Greenwood food blockade story than, than, than Charles Payne had shared with us. And the Greenwood Food Blockade prepared an entry point into me discovering new things about the civil rights movement. In fact, my project intentionally um, 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 looked past the traditional line of civil rights inquiry, and I really wanted to place food at the center. And what does it mean to really show how food played a role? And later on in this presentation and this talk, I'll talk a little bit more about the Greenwood Food Blockade, but that's how I came to this project. It was through my dissertation research at Cornell University. And then I found myself from there doing research at the, um, at the Mississippi Department of Archives and History at the Winter Building, at the Winter Building. And again, that experience really changed the trajectory of this project. I was able to comb through over 100 collections and thinking about the Greenwood Food Blockade. And I soon learned that there was more to the story. There were additional food stories um, embedded in the history or which should I say buried in the history of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. And the Greenwood Food Blockade was a moment where food had been transformed into a weapon of opposition against the Civil Rights Movement. But in response to that, activists in the communities they worked in transformed food into a tool of resistance, therefore reconfiguring the, the rules of, of, of the Civil Rights Movement at the time. And again, I'll talk more about the Greenwood Food Blockade later on in the presentation. But also, when thinking about this idea of food as a weapon, I started thinking to myself, how can we begin to theorize this? How can we think about food as a weapon, but begin to theorize it in a way for us to begin to capture new ways of thinking about the movement? When I say theoretical framework, I'm speaking of a way to see food in the movement, a way, a lens by which we can see new things about the movement through food and beyond. And also, as I was thinking about the theoretical framework, thinking about ways to really begin to um, uh, uncover this story, this, this food story, the civil rights movement, I, I went to a meeting in October 2019, and I was in New York City at the time, and I was attending the Black Urban Growers Conference. And I was there, and again, I, I'd already been thinking about the Greenwood Food Blockade. I'd already graduated with my PhD. So I was already, I was a postdoc at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in African American Studies. So I had been thinking more about how do I theorize, uh, being in academia, I'm required to think about new ways of thinking through theoretical frameworks. So I, I, I grappled with thinking more and more about how can I theorize what I'm seeing around this food story of the civil rights movement. Black Chef Omar Tate out of Philadelphia was also at that conference. And I remember going to one of the panels that he was on and he began his, his remarks with a quote there on the screen that says, food is a weapon that has been used against us. 
black people, but food is also a shield. The minute I saw, the minute I heard that quote, I thought, wow, that's exactly what I hope to capture in my book. And in fact, for those who have purchased my book, I begin the introduction of my book with these very words. Food is a weapon that has been used against us, but food is also a shield. But then when I began to even break down and think more about this idea of food as a weapon that's been used against us, but food is also a shield, I broke the quote into parts and thought more about how we theorize, again, this, the ways in which food has been used as a weapon in African-American life. And when he says food is a weapon that's been used against us, he's telling a story about what some legal scholars, historians, and political scientists call food power. They theorize the idea of food power in times of international conflict when one nation withholds foods or the means to produce food from another nation in order to mitigate the impact of the conflict and make sure the conflict works out in their favor. That's what they call food power. So I took this concept of food power and I transposed it into thinking about the civil rights movement, transposed it into the history of the civil rights movement in Mississippi. And I was able to see, again, theorize how particularly those who were in power used food as a weapon against African-American communities. But what this theoretical framework food, of food power failed to help me with was how these communities responded. Throughout African-American life, there's never a moment where African-Americans are being oppressed and then they don't respond in some ways or retaliate in some ways, one, as a form of survival, but then also as a way for them to thrive given their current sociopolitical or economic or even environmental conditions. But what it, So that theoretical framework of food power failed to do that. So then there's this other side of the story, but food is also a shield. And I theorize it as what I call emancipatory food power. Emancipatory food power helps us understand how those communities who have been oppressed, particularly African-American communities, uh, uh, counter-weaponize food and use food as a way to emancipate themselves, even if temporarily. Put together, the interaction between food power and emancipatory food power is what I call food power politics which I define as any set of interactions during times of conflict, whether formal or informal, between social actors that strategically use food in oppressive or emancipatory ways to mitigate the impact of the conflict. So throughout this talk, throughout reading my book, when we think about, so when we hear food power politics, this is exactly what we're thinking about. We're thinking about what bell hooks will call these struggles for power, and that's how she, how she defines politics. So food power politics, again, is this definition right there. Any set of interactions during times of conflict, whether formal or informal, between social actors that strategically use food in oppressive or emancipatory ways to mitigate the impact of the conflict. This theoretical framework is born out of the lives of particularly Black folks in the Yazoo, Mississippi Delta region. In fact, I theorize this thinking about the lives of those particularly sharecroppers and those who did not own land, but those who worked the land there in the Northwest quadrant of the state. Therefore, when we think about food power politics, it's a good time for us to take a brief look inside the book and talk about this Greenwood food blockade. Now, I've, I've talked a lot about the Greenwood food blockade over the years, and I realized as I was preparing this talk that I've spent a lot of airtime, particularly thinking about the ways in which food had been used as a weapon against African-American communities, particularly in my presentations. Now, in the book, I provide equal airtime thinking about food as a weapon against African-American communities and then how they also counter-weaponized food in response. But particularly in this particular talk, I want to focus more so on how activists and their communities and the communities they worked in responded to this Greenwood food blockade. And I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by when I say Greenwood food blockade. So we'll take a brief look into chapter one of the book. But in order to understand the Greenwood food blockade, in order to understand the ways in which food had been used as a weapon against African American communities and how they responded, it requires us to think about a letter that Bob Moses wrote in February of 1963. It was a letter to what he called his Northern supporters. Now, those who know who Bob Moses is, although he's not, he was not from Mississippi, Bob Moses played a major role in the development of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement, particularly through the lens of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And what Bob Moses did when he wrote this letter to Northern supporters, he was talking about a food drop. And, the, and he, he writes, the food drive you organize and publicize with the help of Dick Gregory and others has resulted in and served as the immediate catalyst 
for opening new dimensions in the voter registration movement in Mississippi. The food is identified in the minds of everyone as food for those who want to be free. This food drive that Bob Moses is talking about is not just some regular food drive when we think about donating canned goods, particularly to a, 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 a local um, um, food drive, a food pantry, and things of that nature. It was much bigger than that. In fact, it was a national food drive, but the character of it and the logistics and the dynamics of it was different. But this food drive was in response to the Greenwood Food Blockade that began in November of 1962 when the LaFleur County Board of Supervisors, Greenwood is located in LaFleur County, for those who are not familiar with uh, particularly Greenwood, Mississippi, is located in LaFleur County. And the LaFleur County Board of Supervisors decided to dismantle this surplus commodities food program or a federal food program, what we would call, uh, when you think of government cheese or government peanut butter, it was those kinds of items were 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 distributed through this surplus commodities food program. So the Greenwood Food Blockade begins when they decide to dismantle this program as a form of voter suppression and activists read it as, as, uh, through that lens. And I'll talk more about that soon. But to understand the reason why they were able to basically dismantle this surplus commodities program requires us to think about the food context of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement, which is located at the intersection of black freedom, white supremacy, plantation economics, and voter suppression. So this is the food context of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement, and it shaped the lives. Again, when I talk about this particular story or this particular context, I'm speaking of African-Americans that worked as rural sharecroppers, those who were considered the poor class in the, in, in the state, who was also, again, these black sharecroppers. That's who I'm talking about here. And they were able to access food in three ways which was shaped by the food context of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. The first way they were able to access this food was through what we call truck patches. Uh, truck patches were these small patches of land, usually located next to a plantation shack, where, 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 where sharecroppers would grow fresh vegetables. They would also raise things like chickens. Uh, also, they would also raise hogs. This is where they would have hog days as well as things of that nature. And this is one way they were able to access food that they were able to grow. But again, the land in which they grew the truck patch on was not owned by them. So any times during, during times where the price of cotton would go up, particularly around the nation in Mississippi, they would grow cotton on any open piece of land, particularly on plantations. So during those years, those truck patches were essentially not used and they were used to grow cotton. So that's one way they were able to access food. But then the other way they, they were able to access food, particularly during those years where they weren't able to, do, to grow truck patches was through these plantation commissary stores. Plantations are not only just a, a store on plantation grounds, but it is a store that is shaped by a number of business and contractual agreements. When we think about the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement and we think about plantation commissary stores, this brings in the white economic power system there in the Yazoo, Mississippi Delta, and how they interacted with the political actors there in the region. So one way they were able to access food was through truck patches. Another way was through plantation commissary stores, where they would go in and usually have credit with, with, with the merchant, whoever owned the commissary store, whether it was a plantation owner or also a grocery, a grocery merchant, who then also gave them contracts to buy food. But the other way they were able to access food, and they were usually able to access food through what I just talked about, was the Federal Surplus Commodities Program. While this was not the only way that many rural black sharecroppers access food, this was an important part and actually was a large experience of a number of sharecroppers there in the Mississippi Delta. So those were the three ways of them accessing food. But when we think about those three ways, whether through the truck patch, whether through the commissary stores or federal food programs, we see that they did not control when, where, and how they access food. Therefore, the Federal Surplus Commodities Program played a major role in their diets, especially in times where there was no cotton crop in the ground. In November of 1962, as activists like Bob Moses and other people, people like Samuel Block, who was the field secretary for the four county there in Greenwood for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, they found themselves thinking about the ways in which the Federal Surplus Commodities Food Program had been dismantled. It had been dismantled in response to Again, the, 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 the large efforts towards voter registration. In fact, the meeting that, that decided that the Federal Surplus Commodities Program in the Florida County would happen was only allowed to be attended by the white citizens there in 
the city of Greenwood and also in the greater LaFleur County area. And that's what brought the Greenwood Food Blockade into focus. But the New York Times also picked up on what was happening in LaFleur County. As I said, there was a number of increased efforts around voter registration drives, but there also was something going on around food. In fact, this New York Times article entitled Mississippi County is turned into major battleground of, of Negro civil rights fight, in fact, talks about this food issue in LaFleur County. And again, it becomes such a big issue because it's one of the first time that activists find themselves not only trying to register to vote, but now activists have to face the fact that those who the communities that they're organizing in are now having to starve because they don't have access to this federal surplus commodities program, and neither do they have access to the truck patch or also being able to get food through the plantation commissaries. So this becomes a really, really big issue, and the New York Times picks up on it, and this is when the Greenwood food blockade begins. By the time this article comes out, it's April 1963, so the blockade had already been going on for about five months already. And this blockade is so important because it also shows how LaFleur County becomes a battleground for the civil rights movement. All eyes are on LaFleur County, particularly during this time, because it's one of the first times not only is there violence towards the civil rights movement, there's also this idea of structural violence that creates these high levels of food insecurity through the dismantling of the federal surplus commodities program. And this, again, begins to spark a number of national conversations. And when we think about the, these national conversations, we also think about the ways in which other national outlets also began to talk about these particular issues. In fact, Jet Magazine ran an article talking about the Green, the Green Food Blockade as well by Mr. Larry Steele. In fact, we see right there on the cover of the magazine, it talks about this idea of, of, of this idea of, of food aid coming to Mississippi Negroes, coming to those who are in need of this particular food. Because again, the surplus commodities program was one of the only ways they were able to access food, particularly also during the winter months when there was no cotton crop in the ground. So, so this becomes a big issue because all of these things are beginning to happen. And even Jet Magazine picks up on it and they're talking about the Greenwood Food Blockade. They're talking about we need all of this food because there's over 5,000 families who have been impacted by this particular move by the LaFleur County Board of Supervisors, which represented the white political power structure of the county and also the city of Greenwood. People like Aaron Henry as well was also a big part of thinking about this, this response to the Greenwood Food Blockade, which took the form of a food drive. But as I said before, it wasn't just any kind of food drive. In fact, the food drive was called what they called Food for Freedom. It was a, a multi-state food drive that brought a number of, of, of actors to, particularly when I say actors, I'm particularly supposed to talk about those who were famous, but also those who were famous also in the civil rights movement. Jet Magazine also does something interesting in their article, is that they also cover a story about Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer, as many people who are from Mississippi know, one of the most important vo voices of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement and the Civil Rights Movement across the nation. Ms. Fannie Hammer, this is one of the first times she's actually seen picture nationally. Um, Jet Magazine provides this picture. If you look in the corner there, she's right there. Um, but her name is misspelled in the Jet Magazine article. So for those who are thinking about researching this, if you want to find Ms. Hamer's name, particularly in this article, they spelled her name H-A-Y-M-E-R instead of H-A-M-E-R. So Ms. Fannie Hammer was also impacted by a similar situation that was in Sunflower County, particularly in her hometown of Ruleville, Mississippi. So there was a similar event there, but it wasn't as big as what happened, in, what ended up happening in Greenwood, as well as there was a similar event also in Coloma County, and we'll talk about that a little later. But this is one of the first times that Mrs. Hamer also comes on the public scene, and she's coming on the public scene talking about food, which also foreshadows the reason why she ends up creating the Freedom Farms Cooperative in the late 1960s. So again, this food drive becomes big because it's a, it becomes a big deal because this food drive is one of the first times that activists not only have to address the food question of the civil rights movement, but they also have to think about how do we also begin to organize communities who need food? They're not going to come vote unless they need unless they get access to this critical food. Therefore, in, in a sense, they find themselves putting voter registration efforts on the back burner temporarily, and they focus on this food drive again through the design of, of, of the Food for Freedom program. 
They end up creating a number of, 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 of flyers. Um, they end up talking with the Chicago Friends of the Student Violent Coordinating Committee. Uh, Chicago, of course, many people who are from uh, Mississippi also may have family members to be Black people in Mississippi, may have families who were part of the Great Migration who moved to Chicago. So it makes sense for Chicago to be one of the, one of the places where the Food for Freedom program works with. Uh, one of the cities that it works with, and they circulate this Give Food for Freedom in Mississippi flyer. They have over 15 different collection depots where they're actually asking people to bring food. Again, Food for Freedom was a program that 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 they designed that they said was just a food drive, but it was much more than just simply a food drive. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. also was a critical part of this food drive. We see an article there from the Chicago Daily Defender that says integration leader Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. issued a nationwide appeal for food for Negroes in Mississippi, who Dr. King said are starving because of their civil rights and voter registration efforts. Even Dr. King found himself making critical connections between food and the civil rights movement through the prism of Mississippi. But then also, Black comedian Dick Gregory becomes a searcher figure as well because he's a part of the Chicago Friends of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and he ends up chartering buses and planes as well to get food into Mississippi. And what ends up happening is that he becomes one of the people that the political, the white political power structure there in Greenwood and LaFleur County, and also the cost the state of Mississippi, argues that there's not an actual food issue. In fact, people like Dick Gregory are just making up stories about starving in Mississippi. So all this becomes a national issue. It goes from just happening only in Mississippi. Of uh, um, Newspapers like the Greenwood Commonwealth are covering it first, but then it goes to a national level. The New York Times, the Chicago Daily Defender, of uh, the New Journal and Guide, which was located in Baltimore, Maryland. So again, all of these things are happening around a food drive known as Food for Freedom. But for us to see how massive the Food for Freedom program is require, uh, requires us to see a map of the program and the network. Again, I said I want to spend more airtime on this particular part of the story of the Greenwood Food Blockade because we oftentimes don't think about the, the, the how sophisticated activists were in not only organizing locally, but also organizing nationally. And I talk about this and I share this map because it's so important because these are the days before text messaging, before emails. So the ways in which this Food for Freedom program and network is even designed is through a number of letter writing campaigns and phone calls. And we see it as the map there. It is a multi-state Food for Freedom program centrally located. The center of it was also the Yazoo, Mississippi Delta region, particularly the cities of Greenwood in LaFleur County, Ruleville and Sunflower County, and Clarksdale in Cahoma County. These three cities become uh, particularly the, 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 the local nucleus of the Food for Freedom program. And in fact, all of these particular cities that are there, Compton, California, Iowa City, Iowa, Chicago, Illinois, East Lansing, Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan, New York City, um, Louisville, Kentucky, Atlanta, Georgia, even Jackson, Mississippi as well, all sent food to the Yazoo, Mississippi Delta in response to the Greenwood Food Blockade. This was a critically important program that really reshaped the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement, as Bob Moses put it. The food drive that was organized was an immediate catalyst for opening new dimensions of the civil rights movement. No longer can we see civil rights only through the prism of voting rights or through the prism of trying to, of education or segregation in public accommodations. We also have to think about food access, food security, and how are we going to take care of those who dare to vote, those who dare to decide that we're going to push back against business as usual, but they also need something to eat. And this Food for Freedom program and network becomes a critical part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee's work, but also the work of other uh, groups like the NAACP and other groups like that who are operating there in Mississippi. As I've said before, Megar Evers also played a critical role in this Food for Freedom program, as he as he sometimes drove from Jackson to Mississippi with car with carloads of food to in his truck and other places. So again, this program is big, but it also it, it reconfigures how we think about the civil rights movement through food. Because now we see that they not only were concerned about sending activists to Mississippi to, 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 to organize in that nature, things of that nature, they also sent food to, the, to Mississippi as a way to address these issues.
But even thinking more deeply about this Food for Freedom program, we also see there were local distribution centers. And I provide this table because, again, I want to provide adequate airtime in thinking about this Food for Freedom program. In Greenwood and LaFleur County, the key site was the Wesley United Methodist Church, which was located right there in Black Greenwood across the train tracks. We also have at Ruleville, where Fannie Lou Hamer transformed her home into a local distribution food center. We also have Clarksdale and Coloma County, where we have the Haven United Methodist Church and activist Vera Pagee's beauty salon. Vera Pagee was an important figure in the NAACP there in Mississippi. She transformed her beauty salon into a local distribution center. Key actors there were in Greenwood were people like Willie Peacock, Ella Edwards, Anel Ponder, uh, Essie Broom, uh, Peggy Mayer, and Freddie Green. I'm going to say people's names because I think it's important for us to think about these key actors who are not often mentioned when we think about the civil rights movement, both in Mississippi and also across the nation. I mean, Ruleville, Fannie Lou Hamer, Charlie Cobb, and Charles McLaurin played a major role in the local distribution of food. I mean, Clarksdale, Fear Pagee, and Anne Henry played major roles there. But it's important while, while there were key actors who played a major role in this particular Food for Freedom program, Black women were the key organizers, particularly on the ground in Mississippi for the Food for Freedom program. Uh, Mrs. Ella Edwards in Greenwood, Mississippi was actually pictured. I mean, the New York Times stacking food right there in the Sunday school room of the Wesley United Methodist Church. While we know very little about Mrs. Ella Edwards based on the notes that Claude Sidden, the one who wrote the article about um, particularly the, uh, the, one talk, the one who wrote the article about uh, LaFleur County being a critical site, a battleground in the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. We know very little about Mrs. Ella Edwards, but it's important for us to see her because she was pictured. And in fact, that's one of the only pictures that we get, one of the scenes we can actually see of the amount of food that was just only distributed there in, in, in Greenwood by Mrs. Ella Edwards and her comrades. We also have Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer in Ruleville, who's, a, again, a very important critical figure. In fact, um, on Sunday, there'll be a program right there in Mississippi, about in Jackson, about Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer that was announced earlier. Then also, Mrs. Vera Pagee played a major role as well. A first Roy Hamlin and historian at Brown University wrote a beautiful book about Mrs. Vera Pagee as well as the work, her work alongside uh, Aaron Henry's. So I bring this up because, again, the Food for Freedom program reshapes how we think about the movement, because not only are we thinking about the central role of food now, we're also thinking about often overlooked actors. And while Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer has gained a, a lot of attention over the last few years, there's still not enough work about Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer and the amazing work that she did there in the Mississippi Delta through the Freedom Farms Cooperative. But also in talking about the Free Food for Freedom program and more largely thinking about the book project, while chapter one recovers the story of the Greenwood food blockade, chapter two takes up the role of food stamps and how it interacted with the civil rights movement. And then chapter four also thinks about the ways in which black uh, uh, ways in which Black youth today are continuing with this food story in the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. And the reason why I didn't mention what chapter three does, because I want to offer I, I want to offer us a way to think about this, my book, as an entry point to recovering stories about not only about food, but also about overlooked actors in the civil rights movement. The, one of those actors, um, so I, I want to pause here now to talk a little bit about the cover of my book as a way, as an entry point into thinking about the civil rights movement. Um, the cover of my book was also a remock up of a picture that was taken by Dr. Doris Derby, a very important figure in the civil rights movement there in Mississippi and again around the nation, a photographer, anthropologist, uh, um, I mean, an uh, important activist who did major work. Uh, Dr. Derby unfortunately passed away, I want to say in March of 2022. Um, so it was a, a huge loss uh, uh, to us, particularly those of us who were doing work um, around the civil rights movement. And me and Dr. Derby spent a lot of time, and she actually helped me uh, select this picture for the cover. And this cover is a picture of the activist, the one standing up, the woman standing up is activist Mrs. L.C. Dorsey. And the reason why I bring up Mrs. L.C. Dorsey, because chapter three of my book takes time to really introduce us to who Mrs. L.C. Dorsey was. Not only was she an important activist, she also was one of the directors of the North Bolivar County Farm Cooperative, which is the subject of chapter three of my book. There is not enough work about Mrs. L.C. Dorsey that exists. Mrs. L.C. Dorsey was recruited to the movement by people like um, 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 people like Victoria Gray as well as Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer. And I bring up 
Mrs. L.C. Dorsey, who later became Dr. L.C. Dorsey, because she was the only woman to lead the North Bolivar County Farm Cooperative, which was one of the largest African-American food farm and food cooperatives in the state of Mississippi in the late 1960s. They worked alongside the Freedom Farms Cooperative, but they also had their own farm located in Mount Bayou, Mississippi. So I bring this up because Mrs. L.C. Dorsey provides us a way to think about how cooperatives also played a major role in the development of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. While people like uh, sociologist, Ms., uh, sociologist Monica White talks about the Freedom Farms Cooperative, she also talks about the North Bolivar County Farm Cooperative, I also want to lift up this farm cooperative as well as an entry point for us to dig deeper into the Civil Rights Movement. Mrs. L.C. Dorsey is one of the most, again, one of the most important figures in the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement, but very little work has been done about her. So I wanted to center her in chapter three of my book as a way to tell the story about the North Bolivar County Farm Cooperative. And just a little bit about the, uh, the chapter of my book begins with some of the, uh, the chapter three of my book begins with some of the words of Mrs. L.C. Dorsey, and they're right there on the screen, and I'll read those, and then we'll move into conclusions and question, questions and discussions. Dorsey uh, writes, the cooperative, the North Bolivar County Farm Cooperative, was organized to help people survive. The trauma created by mechanized farming, minimum wages, and ineffective food stamp programs set the tone for the successful organization of an agricultural cooperative. People were hungry and unemployed. Families were ill because of improper diets. They wanted an opportunity to work and help themselves. They believed in the age old philosophy of sharing and they knew how to grow vegetables. The cooperative was founded by black sharecroppers who had been impacted by the mechanization of farming in the late 1960s. And the reason why I'm thinking more in particular about Ms. Elsie Dorsey, thinking more in particular about this food story, the civil rights movement, because the food context, again, we have to think about plantation culture. We have to think about the ways in which the white power structure would even use food against communities. But we also have to think about how those communities in turn counter weaponized food as a way for us to rethink the civil rights movement. And that's essentially what my book project seeks to do. Um, there's no way for me to cover everything inside my book. In fact, that was not the purpose of my talk today. I really just wanted to uplift one, one of the stories in my book, but also show how the Greenwood Food Blockade was my entry point into learning more about this food story, the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement. And it also provides an entry point for you all as well to dig deeper to uncover your own stories around the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement, particularly through the prism of food and also agriculture. So I thank you all for taking the time to one, log in or those who are there in person. Again, I, I was hoping that I would be there in person to be in conversation with you. I look forward to future conversations and now we can turn to the questions and discussions. Thank you all. If anyone has a question, we'll get you on screen here and We'll let him get. Hello, uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, two things. Well, one, our, our own governor, along with some governors of other states, just a few days ago, has said Mississippi will not participate in the summer food program. And you know that um, I kept thinking about that when you're talking. Also, mm -hmm. when we think of a lot of the. Um, foods that African Americans have uh, given culturally to the Southerners, uh, and I could be wrong, but I've heard my whole life that's because, you know, the plantation owners ate the best parts of the, the pig and gave what was left to the slaves who learned how to take those and make them into a meal. Mm -hmm. was, that the, was that the rest of the question? Was that the whole question? Yeah, I think that was his, his comment uh -huh. follow you. Yeah, um, so the first part of the question, I've been thinking a lot more. In fact, people have been, I've seen a number of emails and text messages about um, the um, how some states have denied the, uh, the summer food aid, uh, aid that would also essentially be able to be used to um, to feed those who are food insecure. Uh, Mississippi alongside, I'm from, I'm from Texas, my home state of Texas also um, declined to receive that food aid. And for me, I thought a lot about that this week because it shows what it shows us more so, it shows us food in the context of the political dynamics of our nation. 
What ends up happening is that our, our governments or our local governments, or our state governments make these kinds of decisions, not thinking about those who are most likely, who, who are most impacted by the lack of food aid. The thing with food block aid occurs because, as I said before, the LaForte County Board of Supervisors had a meeting to dismantle that program, but only white citizens were invited. But only less than 5% of those who were recipients of the federal food aid were white. So again, it's this, this whole conversation around when we think about states that particularly places like Mississippi or also Texas decide to decline food aid, it's because they decide they want to make decisions for those who are especially powerless. So food power politics also puts that kind of uh, provides us with a way of thinking about the particular move, because it's again we see over and over again how these political structures make decisions not considering those or not even thinking about those who will be impacted by the the lack of food aid. And what we do know, given the pandemic, is that during the summer times, a lot of people are a lot of children in particular are more food insecure because they don't have access to the free uh, the lunch programs or to snacks at daycares and things of that, uh, uh, snacks at school and things like that. And also what I, what I didn't say about the Green with the Free Food for Freedom program, it's also in response to that activists were able to petition the USDA, the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, to also reinstate the surplus commodities program. So the Greenwood Food Blockade ends when the USDA comes to Mississippi and forces the LaFleur County Board of Supervisors to reinstate the federal food program. That's also a lesson for us today, and I thank you for your question, because it helps us think about if, if we want to think about how can we get that food aid there or how are we going to feed our communities, given the fact that the state has neglected uh, this particular group of people in the state, then we can also find other ways to whether work with the federal government, organize in those ways or find ways to get food to people. Again, whether it be a federal food drive like the Greenwood Food Blockade, or we work with the Mississippi Food Bank to think about doing that kind of work. So your second question about African-American uh, enslaved people in particular, and thinking about uh, cultural, the cultural aspects of African-American uh, food realities, um, yeah, so so this idea of, of enslaved people getting the, the the worst parts of the animals, the worst parts of the vegetables in that nature, um, it's true. Um, and in fact, <clears throat> what was interesting about them getting the, the worst parts of the animals, they were also able to grow what they called slave gardens or these hidden plots of land where they had fresh fruits and vegetables. So while the, the plantation owners or the slave masters found themselves just throwing scraps to black people, uh, particularly the enslaved, enslaved Africans at the time, enslaved Africans also had a hidden network of gardens where they had access to fresh fruits and vegetables, which is why they were able to use the worst parts of animals, whether it be necks and things of that nature, and they use it to boil it down to get flavor to cook things like collard greens and cabbage, which also tells the story of what we call soul food today. So in fact, you are correct, is that the cultural side of this story is that food has always been a central part of African Americans' lives. It's just the ways in which food enters the story depends on the social, political, um, environmental, and economic systems of the time. So thank you for your question. I really appreciate that. I look forward to both buying and reading your book. This has been very, very interesting. Can you um, speak a little bit more perhaps about African-American farmers during the blockade? And there were and still are quite a few in the in the Delta. Yeah, so so during the Greenwood Food Blockade, because it's located in LaFleur County, a number of the black farmers, so when we think about black farmers, particularly around this time, we think more so about Holmes County. So Holmes County became like this incubator for the development of black farmers who essentially were able to house a number of activists who came down to Mississippi or house activists on their land because they owned it. So, so in my book, particularly chapter three of my book, I provide a conversation with thinking about particularly African-American farmers who owned land. And their role more so, again, in the civil rights movement was mostly because they were able to own their own land. They had a, a particular level of freedom. Now, while they still wanted to vote because they wanted to be part of particularly agricultural boards there um, in the state, particularly when we think about this Greenwood food blockade story, we're mostly talking about those who did not own land, those who were at the whims of a plantation e economic system. But black farmers were there the entire time, and they played a major role in the civil rights movement, particularly in the Greenwood Food Blockade. Black farmers are not necessarily in focus in this particular story that I tell. But black farmers were important there, uh, important there, and both nationally as well. But the story of black farmers is also an, an, an interesting story because while there are particularly a lot of black farmers in context in the Delta, there's not a lot of black farmers in general that now for a number of reasons. 
since 1920, we've seen a decline of, I mean, we are 100 years of decline in black land owned by black farmers, but then also black farmers who are renting land and things of that nature. So also what I'm hoping that this book does is shows that there's also an agrarian story there. And you don't necessarily own land to be part to be part of an actual agricultural story. In fact, you can have a community garden. You can farm in different ways, and we're seeing different models today. So black farmers were a, a crucial part of the civil rights movement. But then the story that I tell about the Greenwood Food Blockade does not necessarily center farmers. It more so centers those communities that activists were working in, particularly those poor rural black communities that were mostly uh, are comprised or composed of sharecroppers. Thank you for the very interesting and informative presentation. I am, I'm just wondering, the, um, in La Flor, the Delta area, um, People are being denied food that they're entitled to. There's a food, food, food blockade against them receiving what they have a right to. Why, is, why was there no legal action taken against the administration? Because when black people were denied what they're, what they're entitled to, like, like at, for education, for example, the NAACP uh, mounted a legal team to enable blacks to get a better education. Why was there no legal action to, to deal with this denial that the black people were suffering in the Delta? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Now, that's a really, really good question in thinking about legal action. There's a, there's a number of, of, of reasons, reasons why. I mean, one is because while people who are recipients of the program are entitled to the program, particularly the federal food program, those programs are always optional. States are not required to have federal food programs. They're not required to give out food stamps. Now, while these are federal programs, states can opt out. So, for example, the reason why Mississippi and places like Texas are not doing the food, pro the food aid that's coming this summer from the federal government is because they don't have to. So there, so even if you do take legal, particularly if they were to take legal action during the Greenwood Food Blockade, they would be they would get around that because again, the Lafleur County Board of Supervisors, who were those who, were, who represented the people, quote unquote, they were the ones who can decide whether to have the program or not. So while legal action action wasn't taken, the the SNCC and other organizations in the state did pressure the United States Department of Agriculture to then come in and they forced the hand of the Lafour County Board of Supervisors and essentially forced them to bring the program back. But there was no official legal action because food programs are, are interesting because of how they're administered. They're optional programs. Then also another reason why is that activists were not prepared to take up a food question during the civil rights movement. While a similar issue happened in Tennessee, food had never been a central, a central, had never been a central actor in the story. So activists like Bob Moses and Miss Fannie Hamer and Charlie Cobb and the, and the people like that, they had never even been able to conceptualize food at the center of the movement. They knew people needed food because people were always hungry, given their their uh, their their uh, economic realities. But they could never even fathom the idea that food would be at the center. And food doesn't take center stage until it's used as a weapon against the movement. And then it opens us up to learning more about food in the civil rights movement. So the reason why no legal action was taken at the time was because, one, uh, again, thinking about the dynamics of how these food programs are administered is optional. So you can't force anybody, any particular political body to, to, to ensure these food programs exist. But then also, at the time, Black people didn't have access to vote. Therefore, the people who were voted into the LaFleur County Board of Supervisors were members of or affiliates of the White Citizens Council, uh, of course, is the Mississippi's emblematic white supremacist group founded in Mississippi. And now, of course, it goes on, it's, it's now known as the Citizens Council. And it's, again, those kind of powerful figures that were able to control what kind of programs come in and out. And again, those programs were optional. Therefore, no legal action could necessarily be taken. It, essentially, no one could actually put in a particular type of injunction, if you will, or some type of uh, some type of litigation against the Lafour County Board of Supervisors. But what they were able to do was to go to the United States government, uh, Department of Agriculture and then force the USDA to work with 
the LaFleur County Board of Supervisors to bring back the program. But thank you for your question. I really, really do. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Hey, Bobby, excellent job. Um, I wanted to point out that you got on a nice pin there, man. And um, I appreciate you representing the museums up there in Illinois. Um, yes, two sir. things. I wanted you to kind of talk about, you mentioned the White Citizens Council. Um, and I remember you talking about the power of place in the story that you're trying to tell there. Um, mm -hmm. Could you kind of talk about the location of where the Citizens Council was founded and its vicinity into the story? And then another fascinating thing that I found about your book was um, obviously when you were down here doing your research, you didn't just want to stick around in archives. You wanted to actually go out there and talk to folks that are doing this kind of food justice work that you're writing about. And mm -hmm. so um, could you kind of talk about some of those youth-led organizations that you ran into in the Mississippi Delta? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mike. I really appreciate the question. First thing about the White Citizens Council, what's, so what makes, and I'm glad you brought the question up, because what also brings into focus again that the New York Times article about uh, LaFleur County becoming a battleground for the civil rights movement in Mississippi and also around the nation, it also becomes a battleground because Greenwood, Mississippi was the headquarters of the White Citizens Council. In fact, I'm, I, I'm blanking on what street, I think it was Howard Street, if I'm not mistaken. The, the White Citizens Council building was right there in downtown Greenwood, not too far from the county courthouse. But it also was on the same street as the Western United Methodist Church. It just ran to the other side of town. So what makes Greenwood so interesting is that it's the headquarters of the White Citizens Council, but there's also the, the temporary headquarters of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee's project in Mississippi. So we have two, the one, one of the, we have SNCC's headquarters and the White Citizens Council headquarters right there in LaFleur County, which created a number of dynamics. But also the White Citizens Council was founded um, there in Sunflower County in Indianola. So not too far from Greenwood, the White Citizens Council was founded. So this area becomes important because this is the place where the White Citizens Council was able to test out some of these tactics tactics of economic intimidation, uh, tactics of, of firing people for wanting to register the vote. And the White Citizens Council is not is, is a different type of, 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 of group because it's a group of people who are committed to uh, this idea of white superiority and black inferiority, but they're also committed to, 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 to basically controlling the entire region through business. So, so, so the people who are white citizens council are not people that are walking around um, wearing hoods and burning crosses. These are people who are business owners. They're bankers. Uh, they're, they're grocery store owners. They are people who are, are uh, county clerks. A number of different people who 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 seemingly on the surface seem like quote unquote good people or it's good citizens. But in fact, they're committed to continuing to keep black people in a particular social, economic, and political place. So that's why Greenwood becomes important. And thank you for your question, Mike, because the White Citizens Council used Greenwood as well as most of the Delta region as a laboratory and a testing site for thinking more about how they can create more and more ways to disenfranchise, ways to uh, 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 create unequal conditions for those who were poor, but then also those who were poor and black as well. In thinking about the second question about going outside the archives, that was one of the most also rewarding parts about coming to Mississippi. While I came that one summer, as you know, I came subsequent summers as well, met more and more people, both in Jackson and also in the Delta. And what was interesting about when I was getting ready to finish the book, I wanted to end with thinking about what was going on in the Delta today. I know there's a lot of work around food justice and food sovereignty in Jackson, but I wanted to think more about what was going on in the Delta. And that's what I learned about the subject of chapter four of my book, which is this group of, of black youth known as the North Bolivar County Good Food Revolution. They call themselves that because they're trying to create a revolution around food in the Delta, but they're building on past stories, whether it's with the Greenwood Food Blockade or whether it's thinking about Mrs. Elsie Dorsey and her work with the cooperative, and they're doing that same work. And I had a chance to go up there and hang out with them and conduct a number of interviews. I spent several, uh, uh, actually during the pandemic, because farming didn't stop during the pandemic, I found myself going back there to visit them a number of times in the summer of 2020, summer of 2021, and I got really close with the executive director and the many people who were, who were over that program. So what was beautiful about ending the book was that the, it was about going back to the Delta and ending it in the Delta and not necessarily ending it and thinking about the state of Mississippi, but thinking about how youth are creating a model, not only for the state of Mississippi, but also for the nation and the world, showing how the food store of the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement continues through their efforts 
but it looks different because the food environment looks different, but their work is so important and it's, rem it's reminiscent of the work that activists and communities they were working with were doing back in the 1960s. Thank you, I appreciate that question, Mike. Thank you all for coming today. We have copies of Dr. Smith's book for sale. Um, please come back Sunday if you get a chance at two o'clock for the Fannie Lou Hamer's America documentary with her niece, Monica Land, and uh, with the director in conversation afterwards. And then join us next Wednesday for History is Lunch when we'll have John Ramsey Miller and Stephen Smith talking about Marigold's um, McCarty Pottery and the um, jewelry that they focused on for several years. For now, help me one more time. Thank Bobby Smith for this fantastic program today. Bobby, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. You all take care.